Hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, thanks, a big thanks to everyone who came in. It's the fag end of the conference, and I hope this session is worth your time. Um, so uh, I am Nitesh Kant. Uh, I'm an engineer on the Edge engineering team in Netflix. Uh, been there for around four years, working on different interesting stuff. Uh, currently working on a, a networking library called RxNetty and a protocol called React Socket. In the previous years, I worked on open source service discovery system called Eureka, uh, a closed source distributed tracing system based on Dapper. Uh, so a lot of interesting stuff, but under the umbrella of IPC, network communications between machines. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, you, can, you can find me on Twitter at Nitesh Khan, and all my presentations, including this one, would be on Speaker Deck. All right. Uh, so since a long, long time ago, people used to communicate or send messages using birds, <laughs> like carrier pigeons and crows in this case. Uh, there was a reasonably dangerous profession of sending uh, messengers to kings. Sometimes they die. Um, kind of a safe uh, model of communication emails came into picture. And nowadays, instant messaging, which uh, helps you do like instant contacts with, your, with the people that you really care about. I think the change in these communications happen primarily driven by the fact that you need feedback around the messages that you are trying to deliver, are they actually reaching the recipients? Or, they are, actually, or the, are they just landing into a black hole from which you would never get a response from? Uh, which leads me uh, to this great quote, uh, which says, continuous delivery without continuous feedback is very, very dangerous. And I believe this is also true for machines. Uh, let's, let's see what I'm talking about, trying to explain as to what I mean. Uh, so let's first uh, establish some uh, common ground as to how machines interact when, when, you, when you open an application like Netflix or any other, what goes behind the scene. Uh, so since I work on Netflix, I take an example, a simple example of how a movie is shown on Netflix. Uh, so if you go to Netflix and you browse and find a movie which essentially you like or a series like Narcos, uh, you get to this sort of screen uh, which has different components about the movie. Uh, the first thing is about metadata, about the movie, as to what the movie is about, how many episodes does it have, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's another important part of it which tells you about your history in the sense like if you, if you start watching an, a series and you leave in between, you come back again, you can resume from the same point, which is called a bookmark. Uh, there is also ratings about the movie, which essentially tells the similar people who watch similar stuff whether they liked it or not which is called video rating. Um, if you go in into code on a typical service uh, to get this sort of data, you would see code like this, which says, OK, I need to get a movie. So first, I'll get some metadata about the movie. I'll get the bookmark, ratings, create a composite object about the movie, and return it back to the caller. Uh, zoom it further. Since we are in the microservices world, uh, we, these different features come into, uh, come into the movie data from different services. In this instance, uh, it becomes a bookmark service, metadata service, and a rating service. The common uh, fact between this communication is that you send a request, which says, like, get movie ID 3 over HTTP 1. And after a while, you basically get a response saying that, OK, this is your data that you asked for. In between uh, the request and response, there is a devil called latency. And we all know that latency is not constant. Uh, it will be sometimes five times as you would normally see. Uh, so what uh, the point here is that in between the time you send a request and you get a response, you don't know what happens back. For what it's worth, it could actually land into a black hole because of a network problem, and you would never get a response. Um, but if you look at the bigger picture, the users which are actually sending the request, they are completely unaware as to what's happening un un in inside your system. They keep on sending requests because it's important to watch movies, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, now what happens is that these requests, since the capacity is limited, uh, the request starts to pile up on the server. Uh, the problem here is that there is a lack of communication because the, the user who's sending that request is not at all uh, aware as to what is happening inside the system, that there is a service which is down or there are, there's a capacity problem, whatever. Coming back to that quote, uh, 
the feedback that is, uh, that is involved in delivering uh, experience is very important. If you miss that feedback, you're missing a very important piece in your communication. And if you're talking about communication with feedback, you're basically talking about a two-way communication. Because at any point in time, when you're making a request, either parties should be able to give you some sort of knowledge about what's happening underneath. Uh, going back to this particular code, if you have a synchronous or a blocking model like this, which says get movie data, the, the, you, it will either return a movie object, a metadata object in this case, or it will return an exception. But during the time that you are making a request and getting a response, there is no way to give any other information back. So it essentially is a one-way street. Right? Uh, now, I'm not saying that this is a huge problem. It is catastrophic and things like that. Uh, we have been working around this kind of systems for a long while. Uh, but the question here is, is it enough, or can we do better? Uh, my claim on, in this presentation is essentially, if you were to completely change your point of view or your approach in designing applications and, uh, and adopt a model called Streams, I, my belief is that it will create much more uh, predictive and uh, resilient applications. So in the, in the slides from now on, I'll basically iterate over what streams are, how do they help change your mental model and get better applications. So in order to, do, to tell you the value of streams, let's first establish a fact as to what streams are. Uh, so defining over here, streams are lazy sources of data. Uh, because They are lazy because they don't start doing anything unless you establish interest in, in, in getting data from it. So they're sitting in a corner, not doing anything, unless you say, I want to receive data. Uh, other important aspect of streams are they, they emit zero or more items. Now this is interesting because uh, generally people associate streams with like an infinite many items that gets uh, emitted on a stream. Uh, if you know of the models that is request response that people usually use, that is a stream of one. Uh, if you have like a notification system which keeps on pushing messages to you, it's an infinite stream of data. Um, Another important aspect of streams are that they are controlled by the consumer. Uh, so the control by consumer is that it starts to show interest in the stream, the emission of data. It also controls how many items that you can emit on a stream. And it also uh, uh, controls as to when you can cancel or stop looking at the streams. Uh, so this is important because whenever you have like a messaging or a push kind of system, you basically have uh, situations where producers are faster than the consumers, and if the consumers are not in the control, you get into situations which, which are overflowing data. Um, so if that is the model uh, that you establish, that those are the streams, then you would see that streams exist everywhere in your daily life. Whenever you see uh, anything, it is actually a stream. Uh, examples that can be a text file, a stream of lines. Uh, TCP, which is essentially a bidirectional stream of bytes. At any point in time, you can communicate back and forth as to what you want. Either, either, either a part of the connection can communicate data on TCP. Um, this is something that people don't generally relate to, because people do not think of HTTP as a streaming, uh, streaming protocol. Uh, but you can, if you have HTTP chunking. You can have an infinite stream of data, which is essentially different chunks over HTTP. And hell, you, don't, you even have them in your grocery stores. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's conceptually as to what streams are, right? Uh, now, that's not really useful if you are looking at how do you model a stream inside an application. Uh, so reactive streams, I think most of people would be aware of reactive streams. It's, it's basically a specification, it's open source, as to how do you model stream primarily within a JVM. I would uh, briefly go through as to what different models are or what different abstractions of reactive streams are. The first important abstraction is a publisher, which is essentially a source of the stream. It, it is a source from which you emit data. It is lazy, as I before mentioned, because you need to subscribe to the stream for it to do anything for you. And when a subscriber comes in, it can have zero or more items. On uh, It can receive zero or more items via an onnext. Uh, it can have... Uh, it can have at most one terminal event, which could be an error or a completion. Uh, and then the other part of it is that you have a control handle, which essentially tells you how a subscriber controls the emissions, which is called a subscription. Uh, 
Uh, a subscription would have two components, a, a flow control component, which essentially tells how many items am I interested in at any point in time. And you can also cancel your, uh, your publications or your emissions. Uh, this is good uh, if you are within the scope of an application. But in real distributed system, it's not just one application. Your request processing, as we saw before, is spanning over multiple services. So essentially, a request fans out, in this case, uh, from an edge to three services. And furthermore, they can subsequently call more services. So what you're really looking at, if you actually were modeling streams or your application over streams, you need streams over application or network boundaries. Because you need to talk over different machines as to how do you model streams and your uh, request processing, per se. Uh, now, when we talk about network uh, boundaries and talking uh, between network boundaries from different machines, the thing obviously comes up is you need to establish a network protocol to do that. Uh, and as we uh, established before, a stream constitutes of application-level flow control, which basically tells you how many items can be emitted, uh, cancellations at times, item emissions, and terminal events. These are the primary four things that gets emitted on a stream or our interaction on a stream. Uh, on the left side, if you see all the, uh, all the data that you basically exchange is coming from a consumer to a producer. Flow control cancellations. Uh, on the right side, the emissions are coming from the producer to the consumer. So if you're looking at a network boundary and there are two, uh, two parts of the, uh, of the connection, two ends of the connection, you need to exchange information in both ways. So what we are getting to is a bi-directional network protocol. Um, talking about network protocol, most of the people are aware of HTTP 1.1. And if we have established that we need network, a bi-directional network protocol, um, is HTTP 1.1 something that can be useful? I guess most of the people are aware how HTTP 1 works. But uh, just to recap, you can send multiple requests on HTTP. It's called pipelining on a single connection. Uh, but the deal there is that when you get responses, you get responses in the same order as the request was received. What does this mean? Uh, it means that the protocol is unidirectional. Because at any point in time, you can only exchange information one way. If you have sent a request, you have to wait. Uh, you cannot do anything about that request until the response comes back. And when, once the response comes back, if the state is over. You cannot do anything about it. Uh, so. Unidirectional, since we need bidirectional things, we really don't need uh, a streaming abstraction on a unidirectional protocol. Uh, there is uh, the next version of HTTP, which is HTTP 2.0, which is essentially bidirectional. It also it, it is a it is a great uh, change over HTTP 1.1 because it provides you bidirectional communication. It also provides you multiplexing of requests, which essentially means that you don't have head of line blocking. But what it lacks is an application level flow control. Uh, application level flow control is essentially the subscriber or the consumers of data defining how much items it can get. Uh, HTTP 2.0 provides byte level flow control. Uh, it's difficult uh, at point when you're saying that you need X items, how many bytes does it constitute of? So it's, it's difficult to, to map between an item and a byte. So that's why application level flow control, if you're modeling streams, you need application level flow controls and byte level flow control doesn't cut it. Um, that's precisely the reason we started off with this network protocol inside Netflix, which is called Reactive Socket. Uh, it is open source. It's created in open source. It's worked upon in open source. Uh, you can find it on GitHub, Reactive Socket. Uh, and its primary motive is to have reactive streams abstraction over network boundaries, which is essentially what we want. And since it's uh, giving you reactive streams abstraction, it is, uh, it is telling you, it is providing you a first class flow controlled, cancelable, bi-directional stream support. Uh, you can run a reactive stream, uh, reactive socket over TCP, HTTP2, web sockets, anywhere, but it provides you reactive stream semantics on top of it. So as a protocol, it supports bi-directional application level flow control. So it's uh, kind of an idle model in which if you were to uh, establish streaming model for your request processing, you can get to reactive socket. Uh, so great. I mean, that uh, gives us a model around like how streams are. Now, if you were to really make use of them, the, uh, the point that I'm trying to drive is that if you embrace these streams model, you can get much more resilient applications and uh, better models around it. Um, so uh, what I'm going to, to, to explain the slides from here on is 
how would you use streams as a basic building block for your applications? Um, in order to do that, uh, let's first see as to how applications are. Um, I use Twitter a lot, so basically I went on and saw like how Twitter is, is basically on, on your devices, how does an application look like. And um, if, you see, if you see at the Twitter stream, the first part is a stream of tweets, which is essentially an infinite list of tweets. It can easily be related as a stream. There is something called like trends, which is essentially, again, a push-based thing, wherein you have a huge amount of hashtags which are trending, which keeps getting pushed from the server. Um, there are notifications, which again are like an infinite uh, kind of notifications telling you about whatever interesting that's happening on Twitter when you're not watching. Um, the other application that I use, surprise, is Netflix. <laughs> and uh, that's interesting. Uh, I think uh, when, when I start looking at it, it becomes more clear as to whether there are streams which are naturally modeled as streams and, uh, and things that are not naturally modeled. So if you look at uh, Netflix UI, you would have a list of list of uh, a list of movies to start off at the top. There are multiple movies that are being shown. Uh, then there is a list of these lists, which we tend to call Lolomos, which is essentially a list of list of movies. Um, and then just like Twitter, you have uh, notifications, which uh, which tells you about any interesting thing that's happening on the background. Um, so as I said, uh, in any application that you look at you would have these typical streams, uh, which is good as a mental model. If you see them, you can directly relate to something which is being pushed, which is infinite, which basically is a notification stream. Then there are things which are atypical streams. In the sense, they are not, you cannot really relate to them if you don't like squint your eyes. But if you, if you see uh, these uh, list of uh, movie, they are basically, they are zero or one items. Yeah, more than one items. Uh, they are lazy because unless you actually start looking at the uh, at the web page or scroll down on that list, it doesn't start emitting items. Uh, so it it is it is important to actually start changing your mental model as to what uh, what exists in a typical application that you doesn't typically relate as a stream. It can be modeled as a stream. Um, you might be thinking, yeah, that's an interesting thought that you can model them as streams, but what's the big deal? Like, how does it help us? Um, so so let's, let me start doing that in the sense that uh, let's, let's start explaining or let's start diving deep into how they actually help you if you start modeling your applications. Um, so uh, nowadays, if you look at applications, there isn't a single device that you use it from. Uh, for example, Netflix has like a thousand devices on which people watch Netflix or use Netflix. Uh, and what's important is that these different devices comes with different form factors. Uh, so you have different viewing areas in, in your application, but the application is more or less the same. For example, if you have a tablet, you may probably see like four movies at a time in a row. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, you will have like two movies at a row uh, at a time. If you have a projector like this, probably 20 movies in a row at a time. Um, the common part is essentially a common entity, which is a list of movie, which, which can be expressed as a flow control stream. So now, certainly, if you look at it, what we talked about application level flow control, that consumer decides as to how many times or how many items at a time you can consume. So now, if you are on a mobile phone, you're basically using the same uh, API, which is saying, give me a list of movie. Uh, but you're saying that I can only have two movies at a time because the screen space that I have is two. On a big screen, you have 20. So what you are saying is that when you use flow control streams, pagination comes naturally to it. There is, it isn't an additional feature on top. Uh, so you can have the same request. You can have the same API. You don't have to change anything. The only thing that changes is the amount of things that you can get. And hence, when, when you're doing pagination, it's established that you don't use save data uh, data uh, transfer on the network because you're not getting the entire list at a time. So pagination provides you better data transfer optimization because you're only getting things that are useful. Um, and since we are talking about streams, they are essentially saying that you have an implicit state because you have a bidirectional communication. At any point in time, you can send feedback back. So you have to have a state, a, a stateful connection which which provides you that uh, possibility of exchanging information. So streams always come with a, with a stateful connection. 
And on a connection, if you layer a full duplex protocol, that essentially means that you can manage state on that connection, which is ephemeral. But it, it is associated with the, with, the, with the connection, but in my opinion, it provides a lot of new avenues to start thinking about your applications in a different way. Uh, what do I mean by that? So um, typically, um, so if you're using HTTP 1, which is a stateless protocol, uh, but you still have state, right? I mean, if you have a user, you're, you're going to Netflix, like you have a user ID, you have an associated geolocation with it. When you authenticate, you have a certain set of authentication information that basically is resolved from your user ID. Uh, so how stateless protocols actually establish the states is by exchanging repetitive information over and over again. So uh, today, if you just do a curl for www.netflix.com, you would get a response which says, these are the set of cookies, HTTP cookies that you need to set on the client, which essentially means that this is the data that I need for every request, and whenever you send me a request, send me this data. This is a way of establishing states between uh, interactions in a stateless protocol. Uh, now, if you, if you use a stateless protocol, you would, you would repeatedly uh, exchange this information over and over again. But if you're using a stateful protocol, you already have a way in which you can store state for that connection. Right? So what you can do is to exchange this information once and associate it with that connection so that you don't have to send it again and again. Uh, so you basically have a handshake. As soon as you establish a connection, you say, OK, this is my user ID, and I'll send it to you. And all these requests on this particular connection would only be coming from this user ID. What the server says is that, OK, I got this user ID. I resolve it into a set of information that I need, and then store that information on the connection. Uh, any request that you send from then on doesn't need that information. So you essentially eliminate all the, inf the cookies, the stateful information that, that is exchanged repetitively completely because you do it once on a connection. So essentially, it eliminates a lot of repetitive information. And it is, it, is, it is coming to you for free, sort of, because you have that implicit state over the connection. Other important or other interesting thing that happens in stateless protocols or common interaction between services is request caching. So uh, there are a lot of things that, that you query from the server that do not change over time. Uh, for example, uh, let's take an example of a bookmark that I was talking about, right? So, I mean, if you have a movie, if you have watched it till a point, it would not change till the next time or till, till you start watching it on a different device, something like that. So your, your state is not changing over time unless there is a different action that happens in the background. People use HTTP e tags for, uh, like, caching static resources, which do not change much. Uh, there is another aspect, which is Hystrix request caching. Hystrix is a library, like a circuit breaker library, which we use for our services. Uh, the common theme between them is time-based caches. Uh, so it, do you do, based on some pattern or some criteria, you decide that, OK, this resource is not going to change for the next 10 minutes, an hour, or a day. The problem with this uh, kind of caching is that it needs an expiration because you do not know as to how much time it is valid. For example, a bookmark, right? I mean, I'm saying that, uh, that I'm caching the bookmarks because I know it will not change for some time, but how do I know an event that has actually changing it? Uh, and these expirations are usually, like, I don't know, and what, what is the time that I would, I would put it at, right? An hour, a 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, so it basically becomes a problem of providing a TTL for that cache. If you have a stateful protocol, what you can create is something called live caches, wherein there is no explicit expiration that is, that is defined for that particular entity. Uh, but what it is is that you establish a stream of, uh, of information as opposed to a single request response. I, I say that, okay, I need to get a bookmark for movie ID this, for this user. And the server says, okay, right now that the position that you left at was position X. And it goes ahead to the client, and the client caches it, saying that whenever I am rendering that movie, I would say that you are at uh, position X. And at some point later, maybe your wife started watching the same movie on a different device, and uh, the position moves. You basically bookmark moves from one place to another. Server knows about it, and it pushes you the information of why. So now, the, what is this creating is that it'll give, it'll give you a very handy way 
in which you can cache data or cache information on the client side, but still it is live because it's changing on demand whenever things are happening. So you eliminate the uh, you eliminate basically the time-based caching, and uh, and uh, and replace it with a explicit server push expiration. You uh, is, uh, you basically eliminate I don't know part of it and say that whenever it changes, just let me know. So that's, I, I believe that's pretty handy in, in general terms. Um, other interesting thing that happens today uh, are like, uh, since, since, I mean, it, any request that you make is not like a single request, it fans out into multiple different, uh, different services in different ways. Uh, so what happens is that, let's say you, you went to a, a, a Netflix uh, site, right, and you, because you, essentially went to a page, I started off processing n number of requests. And those requests fans out into different services, which subsequently fans out in different ways. Now, uh, what happens is that after you're just browsing, so you basically moved away from a certain part of the website and moved to a different place. Uh, so since the services downstream do not know about what is happening, in the sense that you're no longer uh, interested in that data, the processing is still happening in different parts and different services. And they compute all the results, send you back the information, and when it becomes at a, at a point wherein you have to send the response back to the user, it basically decides, okay, nobody's looking at it. And the whole processing that you're doing is essentially a waste. Uh, so essentially, when the user walks away, all the processing that you're doing is essentially of no use. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, modeling your interactions um, as a stream, uh, what you are saying is that the cancellations are, in effect, propagating across network boundaries. So whenever a user walks away from a request, you no longer have to do any processing that is not required, because all the requests that were fanned out are actually canceled. And depending on how much you can cancel, they are actually uh, saving a lot of processing on the back end. The, the real nice thing about this is essentially they are usually built, built as different features. You will have pagination in your, uh, in your applications. There is an interesting thing about request expir expiry, which essentially tells that I, I have a time uh, bound on the, number of, on, the, on the time that I'll, I'm ready to wait for a request, and this is propagated on every layer, and people just don't make requests if the expiration is already expired. So the point here being that if you, if you follow a model, that generically express these concerns, typical concerns of a service, you do not need to build those special features in your application to handle those stuff. Um, so the other part is, uh, so it's good that you can reduce features. Um, the other interesting aspect of, of modeling your application service stream is that it provides more resiliency. How? Um, a typical, um, Problem with applications is essentially like handling overload of servers. So it may happen that you are under-provisioned, or certainly there is a request spike, and your server is getting more requests than it can actually handle. Typical way people handle this is by throttling on, um, on the servers. So in a regular case, you will have like a request and a 200 OK response, but when you are under load, you would get a 503 service unavailable exception, or a status code. This basically means that I cannot handle your requests, so back off, don't send me any more requests. Um, uh, now, uh, the, the, the interesting aspect is that, okay, you told me to back off, but when should I come back again? Uh, so I have, I have a server, I mean, if one of the servers is throttling, it's okay, I would not look at that server again, but what if most of my fleet is actually throttling? What do I do? How do I select the next server that I want to go to? Uh, so what people do is, in, because they cannot guess as to when will the server be OK next to, to actually get these requests, you would have different strategies like exponential back off, back off with jitters. You're basically trying to estimate as to when the server would be ready to, to take more requests. Um, so can we eliminate this guesswork in any ways? Like, how would it be if we can actually tell uh, deterministically as to when a server would be ready to take requests more? So there's a concept called request leasing in, request, uh, in Reactor Socket that we built in with this thing in mind. Um, it basically flips the model from the client having to determine as to 
what is the right server to go to and how much a server can handle. Uh, by reversing the model, what we say is that, okay, uh, let's, since we have, uh, since we have, uh, sorry, since we have a stateful connection and we can actually send requests from one peer to another always, uh, let's, let's start to establish this thing wherein the server says, okay, instead of you deciding what's the right load for me, I would tell you that for the next one second, you can send me five requests. And the, the, uh, the client can send at max five requests for the next one second. Uh, in real life, since you are not always talking to a single client, you would have n number of clients, and you can distribute your capacity over these uh, n number of clients. So if there are eight servers, you basically say, like, okay, 10 requests per client, and that's what you can do uh, in, the leg, in the next one second. Uh, your total capacity from somewhere you determine that it's 100 RPS, and you have eight clients, you distribute 80 RPS, and have reserved capacity for 20. Uh, what it is doing is, uh, is providing a time-bound lease. Uh, if, you, uh, if you guys are aware of HTTP2 max requests or max concurrent streams at any point in time, it does the same thing, um, although the difference between uh, the two is that this is time-bound and the other is not. Uh, so, uh, and the receiver controls the flow of requests, so basically if I am the server who's ready to re accept requests, I control how many requests can you send it to me. Uh, and the good thing about time-bound leases are that you don't have to do any additional work when you are actually landing into trouble. Uh, if it is not time-bound, uh, you, uh, you are saying that, okay, when you are in under trouble, you need to reduce your limit. So you said, okay, at any point in time when I was healthy, I can serve 100 RPS, but now I can serve only 5 RPS. So in a nutshell, you would have to say, okay, client number 1 to 8, you cannot send me any request. So now you are doing more work to, to reduce the work that you want to do. Uh, but in case of time-bound leases, the only thing that you have to do is to wait for the time to, to expire. So you don't give any more leases out from then on, and hence you reduce the load on the server. Um, so, uh, and when things get better, that for example, you have a GC and you're done with it, you can handle more requests, you can actually start sending out leases again. So what this essentially provides you is kind of a self-healing system in which you do not, if you are under-provisioned, if you are in load, you do not get into catastrophic failures. Because what happens is that if you are in under load, all the ser whatever servers are available, they would get more requests because your overall capacity is reduced, and, but the incoming request load is the same. So whatever servers are available now would get more requests. So that essentially leads to catastrophic failures, but if you can degrade yourself in this way, in which you can determine or cap the number of requests that you can get, you have a gracefully degraded system as opposed to a catastrophic failing system. Um, so in a nutshell, I mean, we are, uh, we are basically trying this out and we have seen good results in production. Basically, you are, you are, you are degrading much gracefully as opposed to uh, a, a circuit breaker or a throttling kind of a scenario. Um, so if you do all the things that I've been talking about for the last half an hour, uh, you're basically doing that the request processing that was, that was uh, expressed as this, like a request, you are converting it into a stream of a uh, item, which is a publisher of movie in this case. So, uh, so the entire request processing is expressed as a stream. And you get the benefits because, because you're getting all those things for free, with the, because the abstractions are powerful. Uh, so the point here being that if you have powerful abstractions, it basically removes or reduces the amount of feature that you have to put in your application. And hence, you can focus on actual application code rather than adding features from a framework or an infrastructure point of view. Uh, so the, the powerful abstraction that it is here is a stream. Uh, if, uh, and I believe personally, and, and we are working towards this, that if you adopt this model, you're basically getting more resilient and more powerful applications. Uh, that's about it. That's what I have. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I think I have plenty of time, so yeah. I mean, if you have questions, I'm open to answer. Uh, 
the question is, what kind of data flows cannot be modeled as a stream? Um, I guess I, I haven't seen them uh, in the sense that, I, I mean, it's, it's such a generic model that you can actually uh, express anything that you have, for example, a request response to anything that you get. Uh, it can be modeled as a stream, whether it is lazy or asynchronous over a large uh, time boundary is something that varies from one model to another. Um, does that answer your question? I know. I mean, do you have something in mind which is not expressive? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I guess in the financial side, you have to handle transactions. Uh, how would you, that's kind of a specific example of what you're providing a stream. It seems like something where you have to like manage state in two places and keep them synchronized. Synchronized, is the key word. Sure. I mean, uh, so when we are talking about streams, we are not saying that it is, it is non-transactional. All that you're saying is that your request and response is essentially stream-oriented, so you can control it even after it is created. It doesn't mean in any ways that you, you're basically ephemeral. You, what you're saying is that the response is expressed as a, as a stream. You can control how much it generates and when it generates, as opposed to like, not having control after you started your request. Great. Uh, it's a great question. I think what, what I get from here is that, uh, one, that since we are talking about uh, React as Socket, a protocol, it is pretty intrusive because you have to change a lot of your applications to get to this. Uh, and second is how do you actually get a benefit from it by adopting it in the application? Like, it's a lot of change, right? I think the first important aspect is to, to, to start modeling your intera interaction as asynchronous and stream-oriented, and then uh, right now, if we were to say our, our edge services are actually completely asynchronous, but our network uh, is I/O, IO is, uh, is blocking. So you are, once you have an asynchronous model, you can always plug in blocking model underneath and slowly move from one blocking model to asynchronous model. So I think the first important step in moving such, towards such an architecture is to adopt asynchrony. And then you can change underneath whatever you want. Cool. Cool. All right, any other? Yeah. How do you deal with uh, uh, load balancing? Usually you are not dealing with a single server or a persistent connection. So uh, as we have persistent connections for a long time, uh, we usually have uh, load balancing issues as well as, as uh, systems get added to the list or they move, you know, how do you deal with those kind of situations? Cool. So the React Socket implementation is ja in Java comes with uh, load balancing support internally. There are two phases. One is the request leasing that I talked about. The other is essentially judging what is the health of your server in general between the leases. Uh, so there is a keep alive that happens bidirectionally on Re React Socket. So you have some idea about the latency and the uh, liveness of the, of the server. Uh, then you have, since you are basically looking at a connection and you are seeing how many requests are flowing through them and the latency around every one of them, so you basically have bands of latencies in which you can judge which server is better preferable over other. Uh, so it comes with those algorithms on the client side which decides based on the interactions that you're having as to what is a preferable server for a request. So you are assuming that uh, the client has got connection to multiple servers at the same time and has the choice of sending the load to multiple servers. Of course. Basically doing time cycle modeling. Yes, essentially. So, uh, I mean, yeah. So we do not have like an intermediary like hardware load balancers. We, all, we have client side load balancing, uh, which is essentially more control over what things you are doing, as opposed to having a centralized load balancer in place. Cool, thanks. All right, all right, thank you then, yeah, thanks.